Good evening. My name is Shubhata Rai, and I teach in the History of Art Department. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today as part of the Tagore Festival. The festival is being presented under the aegis of the Tagore Program on Literature, Culture, and Philosophy at UC Berkeley. The program was launched in fall 2020. The first of its kind in the US, the Tagore Program is designed to showcase the life and legacy of Rabindranath Tagore. The program will sponsor talks and workshops on Tagore, as well as other public events like the one today. It will also fund a semester long visiting professorship in Tagore studies at UC Berkeley. The festival ends on February 14th. For more information, please go to the festival website on the Institute for South Asia Studies webpage. A few housekeeping remarks before we begin. We will have a lecture for 30 minutes or so, followed by Q&A. Please submit your questions via the Q&A box. And now it is my pleasure, a distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Aurindam Chakraborty, our speaker today. Graduating from Presidency College, Kolkata, Professor Chakraborty did his DPhil at Oxford 32 years back and taught at Calcutta and Delhi universities and at University College London. He's currently Lenny Distinguished Professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Hawaii at, in Manoa. Between 2018 and 2020, he occupied the Nirmal and Augustina Matu Endow Chair of Indic Humanities at Stony Brook University. Over the years, Professor Chakraborty has published a number of seminal books, including the Bloomsbury Research Handbook of Indian Aesthetics and Philosophy of Art, Comparative Philosophy Without Borders, Essays in Fusion Philosophy, and more recently, Realisms Interlinked, Objects, Subjects, and Other Subjects. The book of questions, an analytical introduction to Indian philosophy is forthcoming from Penguin Random. In the past, Professor Chakraborty has had visiting fellowships at Trinity College, Cambridge, the Rajini Kothari Distinguished Chair of Democracy at the Center for Study of Developing Societies, Delhi, visiting professorship at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, and more recently, a visiting professorship at Ashoka University, among other positions. Among his seven published books in Bangla, Thinking About Food and Clothing, Bhat Kapoor Bhavna was awarded the 2014 Ananda Purushkar. Professor Chakravarti, thank you for joining us and I invite you to the stage. On the 7th of August, 1941, in the city of Calcutta, A man di died. His mortal remains perished, but he left behind him a heritage which no fire could consume. <coughs> The death of Rabindranath Tagore is intimately connected with the birth of Satyajit Ray's cinematic creativity. Ray's first film was this documentary called Rabindranath, which opens with the footage of RNT's funeral procession. Immersed and soaked in the Upanishads, especially the Isha Upanishad, which end by an enactment of the dying moment of man. And the first verse of which this Upanishad confessedly transformed the life of his father, Devendranath. RNT must have wished to live an active life for a hundred years. I hope the audience doesn't mind 
between the dilemma of still continuing the colonial heritage of calling him to go when there is chance in my talk of confusing him with the other Tagore, Rabindranath, and just using Rabindranath all the time. I have just solved that by calling him RNT. Now trained in that Upanishadic tradition, as I said, drenched, soaked in it all his life. He must have wished to live an active life for a hundred years. Because the second verse of Isha Upanishad says, Kurvan neveha karmani jijibishet shatam samaha. He did not quite manage to do that. So there was a gap between what he willed and what he managed to do, like for all of us. Having died 19 years before he was 100. This lecture is a meditation on RNT's lifelong engagement with death, with his philosophy of death, so to say, through the lens of Upanishad, Emily Dickinson, and Emmanuel Levinas. Obviously, with no claim that Rabindranath knew Dickinson's work or that Levinas read RNT. Rabindranath says in one of his not so poetic poems, at this point, I'm supposed to start sharing screen. Okay, so Rabindranath says, next one, in one of his not so poetic poems, I do not wish to die in this beautiful world. I want to live amidst human beings. Yet one of his popular song lyrics from his adolescent work Imitating the version of a poet Vidyapati goes, let's see, does it have, is it there in the next one? Um, no, keep it, keep, keep that one. Okay, so uh, it goes, death, you are like the dark lover god, Shyam, that is Krishna to me. You are cloud colored and have clouds as your matted hair. Um, this is actually put in the voice of Radha, if you follow the poem, Maranare Tuhumama Shyama Saman. But if you follow till the end, you'll see it's not Tagore's voice, it's Radha's voice. But obviously, this is a peculiar kind of Krishna who has matted hair, Mega Jata Juta. So Tagore has taken uh, the poetic license to mix up Krishna. Uh, and Krishna and Shiva. Was Tagore afraid of, afraid of dying? Or was he falling in love with a romantically imagined death in some kind of eros of Thanatos? Why would a young poet with no history of depression or suicidal psychosis imbibing the Isha Upanishad warning that those who kill themselves enter into blind darkness after death? Why would he court death at his divine life, divine beloved. I have no patience with the industry made out of Tagore's relationship with his sister-in-law who committed suicide that traces all, that industry traces all his literary and erotic imagination to this older muse. Yes, the young man had too many encounters with death, mother, sister-in-law, father, wife, son, daughter, all of them died between his ages and 14, uh, ages 14 and 50. But to try to interpret his poetic ontology of death in terms of his trauma of witnessing the suicide of his beloved sister-in-law would be as ridiculous. It's done very often as understanding Schopenhauer's philosophy of death in terms of that irate philosophers kicking his landlady down the stairs, which is a fact, but very bad basis for philosophical interpretation. A week before his death, he wrote a poem, The Dark Night of Sorrow. You could, show that or you could put those down. Yeah, both of them, right. The Dark Night of Sorrow, Mrittur Nipun Shilpo Bikirnu Andhari, Death's Skillful Art, 
laid out in scattered darkness. But then he also asked this question. The last son of the dying day asked, who are you? And never received a reply. This more or less is the single most important point for my lecture today, but I don't come to it until the very last slide. Ludwig Wittgenstein, the most influential Western philosopher, next slide, of the first half. So that one, next one. <clears throat> of the first half of 20th century, read Rabindranath Tagore's play, King of the Dark Chamber, avidly, but felt an inarticulate and somewhat suspicious attraction to the dark theme of the invisible lover king of Sudarshan. You might look up, you know, nowadays, everybody has the encyclopedic uh, teacher, Google. So you could look up very interesting change of mind Wittgenstein had, but ultimately he was like Yeats, so unhappy with Tagore's English, although he didn't read the original, there is a manuscript available in the Wittgenstein archives, which, um, which says, on the title page says, uh, King of the Dark Chamber, Tagore's, Rabindranath Tagore's play, translated from Rabindranath Tagore's English to Wittgenstein's English, and Wittgenstein himself was not an English speaker. So Wittgenstein said, death is not an event in life. Through. Would, would Rabindranath have agreed that death is not an event in life? In fact, you will see in the main poem that from which I have chosen the title, uh, Why Do You Whisper So Secretly in My Ears, Death, um, that he actually wants, wants a big event, okay? Urdu poetry would have said, a sort of big hangama about his death. And he was sure that death will not come like that with the festival. Uh, he was not talking about, you know, chief ministers, you know, firing guns, you know, after it was done after Ritupurno's death. He was talking about the death itself being more festive. What about dying? We shall draw a distinction later in this lecture between the fact of being dead, in which the dead individual cannot be participating, um, because it is like the world minus the dead person, and the process of dying, which the living individual undergoes and very much participates. Perhaps nobody else participates in it. Rabindranath Tagore has recorded deep and logically coherent reflections on this borderline between being and nothingness, which we call time. Next slide. Right. This is my translation of the poem called Mrittu. There is only one poem, as far as I can tell, in the entire oeuvre of Tagore, uh, called Mrittu. And this is it in Punashcha, the book called Punashcha. I bring to mind the image of death. The last day, I think to myself, has arrived at its final crowning instant. All that is said to exist, all things, creatures, desires, endeavors, all the countless unknown energies whirling in spaces remoter than the remotest, churning and rotating in the bosom of that great cosmic sea of time, all of them are on this near side of that flickering limiting line of this sentience of mine. I have one foot on that limiting borderline, on that, you know, deadline, while the other has been extended beyond to that other side of the line, the other foot, where an unobserved future waits with the rosary of its endless days and nights strung together in light and darkness. So the world will go on spreading out into the future, as it did before my birth in the past. In that dense allness of all, suddenly I am not there. Can this be true? Next slide. <clears throat> okay, skip that. 
I will skip that song. Okay. That poem ended with an argument. Okay. Let this be. But the argument was, is there anywhere even the tiniest, tiniest slit in the reality around us? Had there been even a small hole where none being ruled, would it not have, like a black hole, sucked back the rest of reality by it? By which it's a reductio ad absurdum argument, since that is not the case because the world still is there. Therefore, there is no hole. Therefore, death is not an emptiness. But unfortunately, Rabindranath's longest poem, directly addressed to death, is untranslated. The music of the original reverberates with the, as I'll share with you, the recently uh, passed away, uh, the, the great actor, um, Shomitra Chattopadhyay, reciting a couple of stanzas of that. But that, this, Oh, death, hey, death, oh, go, moron. This would be repugnant to contemporary English poetic idiots. So our friend Radice, when he translates it, it has to sound, you know, right to the English ear. So he skips the apostrophe of oh and hey and just says death, death, okay, which I think Misses the uh, thing. Now, Yates wrote in a letter, damn Chaco. He's more interested, it is more important for him to know English than to be a great poet. So he's now sort of ruining it. Now, uh, by this next slide. If we listen to Yates, which says no Indian knows English, and he would perhaps say that about Shukanta Chaudhary also, which I wouldn't agree, and most of English literature people would not agree now. But if that was true, then my lecture and the entire Tagore program in UC Berkeley must be scrapped right away because it would not be done in Bengali, it would be done in English translation, everything, pretty much everything. Squirming with self-doubt, our friend William Radice translated Moron Milan, Death Wedding. Now, right there, you know, there could be controversies about this. Why do you speak so softly? Death, death, I would say death, oh death. Creep upon me, watch me so stealthily. This is not how a lover should behave when evening flowers droop upon their tired stems, when cattle are brought in front in, from the fields after a whole day's grazing, you, death, death, approach me with such gentle steps. Alas, will this be how you will take me, death? I cannot understand the things you say. I do not know why you thus come and go. Tell me, is this the way you wed? Death death unceremonially with no weight of sacrament or blessing or prayer. Okay. Now, uh, at this point, I'll share screen. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, I should. I should do that because I would like to uh, make you guys listen to Okay, sugar, don't forget it. Go to the next slide. Let's see if we can. Um, will it be too much if you try to? Let me try, Paul. Ah. Let me try. Otu chupi chupi kano kotha kao. Ogo moron, hemor moron. Oti dhire se kano che rao. Ogo eki pronoi di dharon. Jabe shondha balai phulo dal pade klant brinte nomia. 
जब फिर आसे गोठे गाभी दल सारा दिनमान मठे भ्रमिया तुम पशे आसी बस अचपल ओ गति मृदु गति चरण हमें बुझी ना जे कीजे कथा कौ ओ गो मरण हे मोर मरण हाय एम कर चोर ओ गो मरण हे मोर मरण चोखे बिछाइया दिबे घुम घोर करी हृदय तले अवतरण तुम एम की धीरे दिबे दोल मोर अवश बक्ष शनि काने बजा घुमे कलरोल तब किंकिन रण रणी शेषे पशाहरिया तब हिम कोल मोरे स्वन ही करीबे हरण हमें बुझी ना जे कैन आसो जाओ ओ गो मरण हे मोर मरण कह मिलन एक ही रीति ओ गो मरण हे मोर मरण तार समारोह भार कि नहीं को मंगला चरण तब पिंगल छवि महाजट से कि चूड़ा करी बाधा हबेना तब विजय उद्धत ध्वजपट से कि आगे पीछे केह बबेना तब मशाल आलोके नदी तट आखि मेलिबे ना रांगा बरण त्रासे केंपे उठिबे ना धरातल ओ गो मरण हे मोर मरण जब विवाह चलिला बिलोचन so notice this these lines it makes a reference to a boat and it makes a reference to a torch in the hands of death and um unhappy with william radich's translation of this poem a poet called philip nikolaev translates at least the first i mean he translates the whole poem with the rhymes Why dread so soft death, O oh death, creep up on me, all stealth, and so on. Notice the allusion to a river, a boat, uh, and the burning torch. Let's have the next slide. In the hands of death, <clears throat> all of which are beautifully evoked in the painting by Ganesh Pine, whose hatchings and color palette an obsession with gathering gloom bear the unmistakable stamp of tagore's paintings emerging out of scratched out dead lines of his uh, of his writing now uh, this when i see this painting i think of that last wonderful line of that behag song by tagore uh, Make bullet che jabo jabo, which ends by saying, "Death tells me I row the boat of your life. Death is the boatman, and it is yeah, our life is supposed to be the boat, and the boatman is death." Now, next slide. What is it like to be dead? Only the dead could tell us what it is actually to be dead. but the dead usually are not in a position to tell us anything once death is defined as it is now as having a flat eeg the normal medical assumption is that there is no possibility of consciousness or experience hence whatever elizabeth kubler ross uh, might say and all sorts of parapsychologists nothing there is nothing that it is like to be dead but of course the vedic upanishadic puranic picture goes flatly against this phenomenologically contentless empty picture of the dead buddhi alet allegedly said very profoundly i am not afraid to die i just don't want to be there when it happens perhaps the thought strikes us strikes us as funny because death logically seems to be both the most momentous events in one's life but as wittgenstein noted one cannot really live through it or see it happen so one unfortunately cannot be there when one's death happens dying is not like falling down or falling in love before and after i fall or fall in love i remain the same being i may feel like saying i'm no longer the same person after i fall in love but if it that was meant literally then of course you know one would have to be uh, dumped the day after one has 
you know, somebody has fallen in love with you. Um, now, um, Wittgenstein made this profound remark to his student Norman Malcolm, the drift of which was, the only way I can make sense of the concept of life after death is from the unshakable sense I have that I have duties to others from which death will not release me. We'll have to keep this in mind to understand sort of last point from Levinas. But I'll now pass on to Freud, which is on the screen in a famous essay called Our Attitude Towards Death and uh, War and, uh, well, it's part of the book, uh, Thoughts on War, Death and War. Freud argued that it is impossible to imagine one's own death. His explanation was that we, um, we cannot indeed imagine our own death. Whenever we try to do so, we find that we survive ourselves as spectators. The school of psychoanalysis could that thus assert that at bottom, no one believes in his own death because you have to be able to imagine the content of your belief, but you cannot imagine the content of yourself being dead. Logically, Freud's arguments does not work. Argument does not work. Why does he assume that if I am present existent, then I'm not dead? When the question, is death an event in life, is still open an open question. Freudians need to sort out which comes first, the threat of logical contradiction or the instinctive animal innate fear of one's own death, which the Yoga Sutra calls abhinivish. There is another problem that why should the former non-existence be that scary if I'm not there, then I cannot suffer. So, uh, they are, if it is unimaginable because it is contentless, then it should not be scary. It should have no feel at all. Indeed, if something is unimaginable, it must be unfearable. Secondly, even if death is complete cessation of existence, why should it be unimaginable? I don't need to be a spectator inside the imagined scenario. I only need to be a spectator of my, my imagining now. So please, you know, I have phrased this argument. Uh, it will have taken a long time, but because I have so little time, this sentence captures my argument against Freud. I can witness myself now, imagining being dead. I don't imagine myself witnessing my own death. Okay, if Tagore visualized, let's see, is the next slide the Abhinandanath painting? Yes, good. This was done, Abhinandanath's painting. Those of you who are interested in art history like Shukatu should compare two death paintings. One is death of Rabindranath, and the other is completely different style, like a different painter, death of Shah Jahan, which is much more famous. If Tagore visualized before his own death, this scenario, suppose he had a dream like that, okay? This scenario, okay? He would be imagining his own death. But of course, if in the corner of this painting, you know, he had to see himself, that would be not possible because he couldn't be in two places. He couldn't be a corpse as well as a witness. But all the scenarios we imagine, for example, how the world was, you know, before human beings were existent or before any living beings were there, when the crust of the earth is just settling down from hot lava. Okay, I don't have to imagine anybody. Although this can lead into some very fine details of controversies between two interpretations of quantum mechanics uh, and uh, people like Niels Bohr, the Copenhagen interpreters would be very happy 
at, at Freud's and Tagore's own point, that my complete absence or no observer uh, it would be impossible, you know, uh, but that's, that's a particular inter interpretation. Freud's point still seems to be, you know, in a robust way that I cannot imagine at a future moment experiencing myself as dead. I can imagine that I'm dead. I can imagine doctors are looking at my dead body, but I cannot imagine that I'm dead, but I'm experiencing that death. That's true, because there is simply zero content which could be called what it is like to be dead, using a, a completely epoch-making point that uh, uh, a philosopher uh, made uh, in sort of in the 1980s um, in, a, in a paper called What It Is Like to Be a Bat. Uh, the phenomenal feel from inside is called what it is like to be. Okay, so let's next slide. Okay, uh, what is it like to be dying? It must be feeling some way, not to be dead, but to be dying. And that's what, you know, Emily Dickinson did see that, uh, was, was trying to guess, but she, you know, with her immense emotional intelligence, uh, notes that the dead dying person never told us what it was like. Okay. Um, so let's see next, you know, let's have them one by one, as I'm saying. It feels the following six would be entirely empty of phenomenal content. There's nothing that it feels like. Let's have all the six together. What is it like to be dead? No way. If you are dead, it doesn't feel any way. What it is, it's like, therefore, what is it like to have been dead? What is it like for Satyajit Rai, Shomitra Chatterjee, Ritu Parno Ghosh, Rabindranath, Julius Caesar, all of these people now, as those people, what it is like for them to have been dead? Nothing. What is it like to be not yet born? Nothing. What is it like to be no one? That's precisely the summary of all of them, you know, the previous ones, because that's what it is like to be no one, because the dead person is no one. Even if you believe that there is some life after death, he's definitely not that person. I mean, my social security number will not, you know, carry on to my next birth or in hell where I will be most probably. Okay. Um, and then, but then, what it is like, what does it like, what does it feel like to be a rock? No way. What is it like to be a square circle? Absurd, nothing. But then what about Jivanananda's poem? What is it like to be half eaten cold orange? Next one. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, that, pain, that artwork, conceptual art of a real, uh, stitched together orange, which most probably have been eaten from inside, is, um, is a painting by Zoe Leonard, uh, dedicated to his, her friend David, who, who died of AIDS. So Kamala Lebu is such an important poem of Jivaranda Dash that in, uh, a great Bangladeshi writer has written his full biography, and the biography is called once uh, I leave this body of mine, am I not going to return to this world? That's a, you know, an open question. Let me return. This is the wish. One more time, in one wintry night, as the tragic Korun Mangsho, as the tragic flesh of a cold orange by the bedside of a dying acquaintance. Okay. So look at how... Um, the thought of death of one, one, oneself is taking one to be taking the poet to the thought of another dying person. Okay, so just leave it at, at that. Let's go to the next slide. Death is not only the end for Rabindranath. As for Rigveda, death is the beginning. Vedarnagopanishad, 
which we have got, you know, millions of, uh, not millions, but hundreds of evidences that Tagore very closely read Brihadaranya Upanishad. And it begins, okay, first part, second section begins by, there was nothing whatsoever. It was all covered only by death or hunger. For hunger is death. Death created the mind thinking, let me have a mind. So death was impersonal first because it was the death of the previous cycle of the universe. The new cycle comes. He moved about worshipping himself because no, there's nobody else to worship. And the word for worship is archana. As he was worshipping, water was produced. Because worship requires uh, eating oneself up. Eating oneself up creates sweat. And a part of Atharva Veda says the name for sweat in Sanskrit is Sveda. And that is so crucial that the self um, the austerities of the creator, which is death, results in Sveda. Why is it called so? Because thereby he knew himself well. Su Veda. Veda means knowing. Su means well. Okay. Now, these are all efforts to try to see if death could be experienced. But even if it can be experienced, it will, it's one experience that remains. Theoretically, you can know that it is from where, it is that from which everything is started. You can believe in it, have a faith. But firsthand, experience through your body, of course, it must be for everyone. It must be some way unless one, of course, dies in deep sleep. Uh, there must be some experience, but we don't know how it is. So the scare that we have must be because of that first poem of the book of nothing, not that nothing will exist, things will exist, but I will not be there. That's the scare. Why is that scary? Okay. How does the dead person look around? And no better description of that than Emily Dickinson's next slide. I have seen a dying eye run round and round the room in search of something as it seemed, then cloudier become, and then obscure with fog, and then be soldered down without disclosing, the eyes are closed, soldered down, never to open again, without disclosing what it be that were blessed, that it were blessed to have seen. Okay, now you might say, well, that's Christian belief or whatever, but I think this description would have rung true for our poet, for, for Tagore. Uh, next slide. Now, Emily Dickinson had another poem where he talks about wonder. Now, this is where I want to take the talk. I almost reached the end. Uh, you might say this is not the goal. It's not. But remember Tagore's poem? Seven days before his death, he writes, on the last day, and of course, as you know, Rabindranath had a narcissistic love of his own name. 
So because the name means sun, so this crucial poem talks about the sun setting. Right? And as the sun sets, it asks, okay, uh, who am I? And the way the poem goes, it's more like the sun is asking me, the poet, to go. So if you take my suggestion seriously, then it's Tagore asking Tagore. Robi, the sun, asking Rabindranath, K to me. I don't have time to go into it. But there are many descriptions of the pathway of the dead. Devayan and all that. Vibhuti Bhushan Bhattabhattai wrote an entire novel about that, taking cues from Puranas and Upanishads. But there is one Upanishad, which definitely Tagore knew, called Kaushitaki, which describes the, the journey of the dead, where at crucial points, it's like, toll tax, they are asked for your identity. Who are you? And you have to give something else. But what is amazing is that in the last one in the Koshitaki Upanishad, when uh, a golden mysterious man, not a man, a god, asks in the last stage, the dying, the dead soul, which has to be some, somewhat enlightened, who are you? And this is the last station. And, and if the person answers, I am you, to the questioner, I'm you, then that mysterious God is very happy. Like the boatman with the torch, he says, okay, that's the right answer. Come, sit next to me. That's in Kaushitaki Upanishad. But all of this is very metaphysical and mystical and poetic. But Levinas gives it an ethical turn. The question, yes, death is still a question. The phrase question of death, I interpret like the phrase city of Calcutta where the Calcutta and city are the same. Death is a question. The question of death is unto itself, its own response, Levinas says. It is my responsibility for the death of the other. The turning of the same toward the infinite, which is neither aiming nor vision, is the question. A question that is also a response, but in no way a dialogue question, a prayer, is this not prior to dialogue? The question contains the response as ethical responsibility, as an impossible escape. Let's go to the next slide, if there is any. Right. So Emily Dickinson has an amazing poem about wonder. And the in Bengali word I'm thinking about is vishoy, vishoy, vismaya which is the Sthayi Bhava of Adbhuta Rasa. Adbhuta is an aestheticized version of surprise, wonder, amazement. Okay. Uh, wonder is not precisely knowing and not precisely knowing not. A beautiful but bleak condition. He has not lived who has not felt. This is called the Chamatkar of Adbhuta Rasa. And in one text, Abhinagupta says that achamatkara is jarata. If you have never felt this kind of wonder at yourself, not narcissistic, but the amazement which, which results in unending questions. Okay. And the ultimate question, how can I be dead? without being dying, and how can I be dying without experiencing both sides of dying? How could death not be the most important event in life? 
because the whole being of myself is towards death. That's the end of life. Purpose. Suspense is his mature sister, this wonder. Whether adult delight is pain or itself a new misgiving. This is the mat that mangles men. Last slide. So, in that amazing song that still rings in all of our ears from Devabrata Vishar singing, have searched for Janar Maji Ajanar Kurechi Shonda. So, death is the moment at which one remembers what have I done? I have known lots of things. Kratos Mara. I ought to recall what I willed and what I have done and what I have known as my body ends in ashes. In wonder thus I wake up. Vishaye Tai Jagi. Thank you. Thank you, Arindam, and thank you for a wonderful talk and really a beautiful talk that takes us through the, the philosophical, aesthetic ways in which Tagore, but also Levinas, and how death could be imagined. Uh, we have a number of questions, and uh, I would just like to remind our audience, please you use the Q and A uh, for Q and A. Q&A box to uh, post the question. Uh, we, I, taking the liberty of being on on screen with you, I wonder if you could talk about Owner Thakur's visualization. We talked about poetics, and what strikes me as you were speaking is our current moment and a global pandemic and death, but also the colonial context in which Tagore Tug was writing. I wonder where, if, if where would politics, uh, the politics of death, the politics of dying, the politics of living, how would that, how would you think about that in relationship to the, this question of a philosophical approach to death? So where, where would politics and philosophy meet, both today, but also, in the period that you we were looking at. Right. Obviously, uh, you mean, I would assume that you mean by politics, you know, not as it is commonly used in newspapers when uh, every politician says that the others are doing politics and they are not doing that. But that, you know, that's sort of, uh, that's a fan, you know, bastardized sense of the word. But I'm taking Hannah Arendt's sense of politics, where politics is concerned with uh, some kind of negotiation of power, but in a context of essentially plurality of people. A single person, however embodied and however split personality, cannot engage in politics. So. The first response would be, I think even from Tagore, is that there can be a politics of birth, as we know, population control and all that. There can be a po politics from outside of lots of people dying uh, in pandemic and, you know, plague is a theme on which I have just now designed an entire uh, semester long, 15 weeks class on sickness and contagion and the philosophy of the body. But, and there can be politics of that, whose death is more important than whose health. But the inside point of view from which we were speaking until we come to ethics in Levinas um, is one phenomenon in life 
where one really, really, really is alone. So there seems to be, there seems to be an inco logical incompatibility between plurality and felt death. Okay. That's why, you know, text after text says uh, that you are alone when you die. Nobody accompanies you. Now, this is about actually dying. There could be uh, before that. So that's the, the superficial answer is uh, not so, so superficial that if politics has to do with plurality and death is a singular happening. It's, it's one thing that, you know, sort of set, drives home your aloneness. Okay. So there cannot be a politics of there can be politics of erotic love, there can be politics of everything, but there cannot be politics of, that. there can be very much politics of pain, politics of disease, politics of lots of, you know, dying people, politics of the, you know, the, the book of women in uh, Mahabharata, where everybody is, you know, all the soldiers are dead and, you know, as you know, you know, in Dhanya Loka Lochana, there is one of the beautiful poems of Shantarasa is from that. And this is very political. But then a deeper answer would be that if we take ethics as the core of politics, okay, again, that's why I said, it's not the sense in which politics is amoral. In fact, politics is the place where you can, ethics does not matter, but in Hannah Arendt's sense of politics, which is connected to, you know, in the human condition book, to the chapter, the part called action, and where speech is the ultimate political activity, talking to one another. And, uh, and this is where I was trying to bring Tagore, Isha Upanishad, and um, Jivananda Das and Levinas together, because one of the things that even a poet never finishes is reaching out to people. So, especially at the time of famine, uh, mass death, war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, so, even if there is no, metaphysically speaking, politics of the dying experience, which is singular, there is politics of others' death, okay? Because there, your loneliness cannot be an ex excuse for not doing anything. And that remains undone because your responsibility for others' death, like our responsibility who are sort of happily drawing a salary with or without teaching, teaching virtually, and writing fiery things about how the migrant laborers were, you know, run over, mowed over by the, by the train and so on. But politically, uh, it requires a certain kind of different introspective Look, that's all I would say. Now. No, I, for me, uh, and we should turn to the other questions as someone who works on climate change. And there is a very interesting argument that's made in terms of the Anthropocene and the pop and the increase in population, the notion of death as a mm. possibility of politics. Mm. So I think that's where my interest in uh, politics yes, of death in terms of the Anthropocene. But, but Arindam, no, we should move answering. to the other. So I was answering from the point of view of Rabindranath's death, not death as such. That would be a very open topic, politics. Yes, we should move to the other questions. I'm trying to connect it with the world, right? no, Absolutely. No, no, no. I think it's a very important question, especially as we are living with what we are living with now. Uh, we have a question from uh, Lakshmi who asks, Michael Bhakti would say that our entry into life and exit from life is not event in our life 
death is the final gift that we pass on to others. In other words, relinquish co-authorship of life and let others continue to author our life story. Yes, my Lakshmi, that's a, that's a very good comment. Um, uh, unlike death, which is a question, it did not sound like a question to me, but I think that's, that's a good advice to people like me to relinquish co-authorship. Um, I do think it's very profound, um, but let's have some questions. Uh, we have uh, Jaya Jyoti Sengupta in his, in his book, Rabindranath O Paraloka Charcha, Dr. Dr. Amitabha Chaudhary explores RNT, RNT's interest in curiosity and life mm. after death. How mm. would you analyze this interest when coupled with Freudian concept of being a spectator of death? Mm. Mm. Good question. Good question. I kind of dodged the side of Tagore's Porlok uh, Chorcha, Tagore's parapsychology, as it were, um, planchets and all. Um, uh, because I don't, I think that's as an individual, he would do that. But neither in the poem I was analyzing, you know, Auto Chupi Chupi Kanukata, why do you speak so, so, you know, whisperingly to death and why isn't there no ceremony and so on? Neither in that poem, nor in the more argumentative poem, which says death could not be complete empty, is there an, a curiosity expressed? And curiosity is one form that wonder would take. So I think there are many unfinished strands, both in my lecture, as well as in Tagore's attitudes towards death. And uh, instead of doing a chronological, like, you know, some people think that uh, because he had so many encounters with death, and of course, if a near and dear one dies, then who is, who does not want to know how they're doing? Even people who do not believe, in afterlife, have a hard time not wondering. So the way nowadays very staunch uh, sort of materialists and physicalists and scientific people uh, who do not believe that there is any afterlife, of course, all of us have to, you know, swear that we do not believe that something is, otherwise we will not get a university job. So, I mean, at least here, um, most probably you will have to, in India now under the present regime, you'd have to swear that you do believe in uh, afterlife uh, with a, to get a job. But neither is, both of them are exaggerations. But um, the thing is that um, Rabindranath himself never ever took that argument that he, that there's nothing, that there's nothing that it feels like to be dead. He always would have thought, because as I said, that first sentence of my talk, that he's, he's a soaked in, in the Upanishads. And the Upanishads talk about life after death. And in a separate place, um, a beautiful book that was done by Sudhir Kakar and another German guy uh, called Death and Afterlife. I have written elaborately on this. And uh, one interesting uh, thing about that is, in Bengali literature, uh, Shishendu Mukhopadhyay has a very haunting story called Shapnir Bhitore Mrityu, uh, Death Within a Dream. Um, so that, you know, I've referred to that, and Rashundari Devi, in her autobiography, talks about uh, not a near-death experience, but having been dead and then come back. Now, these are all taken as cock and bull stories by the flat EEG dead kind of you know, scientific people. Uh, Amitabha Chaudhary's book was interesting. Um, yeah, I and mean, I would like to know sometimes what people who are dead, how they're doing. But philosophically, it's more interesting to uh, not go that route, especially if we are trying to understand the course engagement with death. I would stick to my central point. Death is an open question, which, uh, and death is also the boatman 
uh, who drives, who rolls the life boat. And that is not coming from his panchets. We are almost out of time. And I would, uh, the last, I think we have time for just one more question, which is from Taputi Gupta. I am assuming this is my partner Atri's mother, Taputi Gupta. Uh, when did Tagore, where did Tagore derive the idea of death as King Raja? Oh. Um, very, very good question. It's not clear that the king of the dark chamber is death himself. That's not clear. But um, actually, I cannot separate out Ganesh Pine from Tagore here. There are some haunting pictures. I hope Shugato, I am not misremembering, um, of, of a king who is, you know, very dark. In fact, he looks like a monkey almost, I think. Um, well, you know, this Ganesh Pine was obsessed with the monkey face. Um, but um, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Where did he get this idea? Raja is a ruler, right? Ah, yes, of course. A ruler. See, there is a time of the year when we are supposed to remember our forefathers, uh, which ends the 15 days just before the 15 days of Durga Puja, Navaratri, just before that. It's called the Pitri Paksha. I have written and published about it. Um, and it ends with Mahalaya. Um, and there, every day, remembering the names of your dead ancestors, even unknown ones, even strangers, unrelated to you. You have to give water for them. And uh, so there is one verse of, um, which describes Yama, death. You know, with whom Nachiketa, the boy, the fearless boy in Katopanishad has a dialogue, right? And he's called Dharma Raja, right? Dharma Raja, the ruler. Because there is some inexorable law that the law of karma that he rules over. Okay. And uh, so the human mortality, when you think about it, even if you do not believe in the Upanishads, um, is inexorable, is inevitable. And there is a sense of uh, being ruled by death that everybody has. And as a poet, of course, he decorates it with all sorts of lyrical thoughts about uh, how the king is unknown to us. The main point of darkness is, of course, unknownness, unknownness. And death is unknown. And uh, the king is unknown, a little bit like what happens in Kafka's castle. We never get to see it. But um, instead of lamenting that unknownness, one makes a worshipful transformation of that darkness. And that was available uh, early on to Tagore in the darkness of, let me end with that, with the three figures of the Mahabharata. All of them are dark. Okay, The author of the Mahabharata, he is a king maker. By the story, he makes the kings. And sorry for the crudeness of it, but since he, Dhritarashtra's father, Pandu's father, Vichitrabiri, could not actually give us, you know, Vicky donor, so uh, the, the sperm donor, donation. So ultimately, it was Vyasa, the author of the Mahabharata, who is the biological father of Dhritarashtra, the king, the blind king. So Vyasa is Krishna Dvaipaya, dark. Called Krishna Dvaipaya, dark and most probably ugly and stinking. 
But the other Krishna, mysterious dark, is Krishna, the speaker of the Gita, who says in the Gita, Mrityu Sarva Harascha. Tagore had almost the entire Gita memorized. And it comes out in his letters and this that, especially in his young age. He, in Shantaniketan sermons, he talks constantly about the Gita. And there, the Gita says, Krishna says, I am Mrityu. I'm dead. And the last is a woman who is also dark and beautiful. And it's she who's wrath and the violation of her causes the carnage and the Holocaust, the total death, which you see at the end of the Mahabharata. And she is called Krishna Draupadi. These three dark figures, they're all dark and they're friends of each other. But Krishna among them is ultimately identical with Yama, who is Dharmaraj. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. I know that's a wonderful talk and we have to let you go. There are so many more questions and but we don't want to impose on your time. Is there anybody, has anybody asked a question about or to crack a really unfortunate joke? Is anybody dying to ask a question uh, about questions? Because that is I, an open question to the audience. <laughs> if there are no compelling questions, we should. We will forward you the questions. There's some very interesting ones that have been posted on the chat, and we will forward you as text. I want to thank you again for your wonderful talk and thank the audience for joining us. Uh, to remind everyone that the program will continue to February. Thank you again, Professor Chakravarti.